All right. Uh, so if, if again, if you would uh, if you would look at uh, uh, First Samuel, and I have not yet turned there. I'm going to uh, look at uh, chapter one and part of chapter two. I'm not going to read it all together. I prefer to um, to break the, this down uh, based on on the points that I that the Lord I think gave me to give to you. Um, we are induced in these passages to uh, Samuel, the young boy. Uh, Samuel is the the last of the judges. Okay. And he's the uh, and he's the anointer of the first two kings. So Samuel is a pivotal person in Israel's history. He's the transition from that period of judges to the kings. We are also introduced to uh, Samuel's mother Hannah. Uh, there, she is the principal person in this passage. And if you recall, when um, James and Natalie dedicated little James, and when Melissa dedicated Scarlet, Pastor referred to this very passage. Uh, as 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 a, a text for which uh, dedication gave meaning to the dedication, uh, and and so so people you know people have long looked at, at Hannah's uh, uh, her work, her prayer and, and her and her choice concerning her son and, and drawn inspiration from that on how to how to to deal with their own children. So I want to read um, my first point is is kind of the go through the background of, of the passage in verses one through five. Now there was a certain man of Ram- Ramathaim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up to his, out of his city yearly to worship and sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phineas, the priest of the Lord, were there. And when the time was come that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penaha his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. All right, so um, when we read this passage, we're, we're kind of tempted to, to, to blur right past uh, this man, Elkanah. Um, but there's a couple of things I think we can learn about him here. And, and this kind of plays into to, uh, part of Bruce's message in my mind. Um, Elkanah took his family to the tabernacle, which was then in Shiloh, and he did it every year. He came to worship and he came to sacrifice. So ha- after his manner, he sought to worship God in his way in the Old Testament. He, he sought to conform, to, to bring his family under the influence of, of the tabernacle. All right, so um, and, and a couple of verses in Deuteronomy make this... Um, Make this, this was God's commandment. Uh, Deuteronomy 12, 10 through 14 says, When you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell safely, then there shall be a place in which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. And thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice vows which you vow unto the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maid servants and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he hath no part or inheritance with you. Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place thou seest, but in a place where the Lord shall choose in one of his tribes, there shall thy offer thy burnt offerings, and there shall thou do all that I command thee. And Deuteronomy 16 says, Thou may not sacrifice the Passover within thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee. But all the places which the Lord thy God shall, ch- but at the place, excuse me, where the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, there shall thou offer the sacrifice at, sacrifice at Passover at even, even the going down the sun at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. So Israel was not free to, to, to worship God, to pray to God wherever they would. They, were, they, were, they had to take their, their prayers and their offerings to the tabernacle at that time and later to the temple to offer. And Elkanah, after, uh, within his ability, he sought to conform his family to this, all right? So he, um, he was, he, he would, we, and we take it for granted that, that as, you know, we can pray, that we can worship God uh, whenever and wherever we want to, but, but he could not. And, and the, the point of this is, why is it significant? Because this is the time of the judges. So the judges was a period of 400 years which was a general decline in Israel's uh, spiritual and moral uh, history. They, so uh, there's a couple of verses that kind of give us the history. We can give the history of the book of Judges in three verses. 
uh, Judges chapter 2, an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. So this is the beginning of the book of Judges, and this is the, you know, they, they could not separate themselves from the, from the gods of the, of the people that they were supposed to conquer. They subjugated them, and then they assimilated their gods into the culture. So that was, and that was the kind of the history of, of the book of Judges. And then those peoples who, whose gods they assimilated became uh, their, the, the uh, oppressors of Israel. And in Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, uh, Joshua let all the people go, and the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath in Mount Ephraim, on the side of the hill Gaash. And all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there rose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works he had done for Israel. So somehow those works did not get passed on, and the people were for, worse off for that. And the very last book of the, of the uh, a verse in the book of Judges says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. So this is the culture in which, which uh, um, El Elkanah operated. He, um, and, and you think of what Bruce introduced his message with here is that we are not exempt from, from the uh, influence of the world. But here was a man who took his family and attempted to separate, to do something different than what was going around him. He would not have a lot of company on his trip to the tabernacle. He would, uh, you remember in, in Jesus' time, he went to the tabernacle. It seemed like all of Nazareth made that trip with him as a young man. But in Alcana's time, it was different. You know, he was... He was, he was um, he was left to, you know, he was pretty much on his own as far as being a worshiper of God. And that's an exaggeration, perhaps, but he was, he, he was not, a, uh, he would not have had a lot of people to do this. And why this is important is it puts his wife, Hannah, in a place, in the place near the, at the tabernacle where she can, she can uh, uh, communicate with God when, when, in the right time. Um, so let, let's think about this. Um, let's understand this, the commandment we have in Hebrews um, 10, 19 through 25. Sorry, I, I have to keep my notes organized here. Um, so, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful and promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So, we have this commandment in the New Testament um, to... To, to come together, um, and, and, and we also, in, in the dark times we live in, we need to persevere as those who gather unto God. Um, and and our, so our circumstances are, are very little different from His. Um, we must persevere in the activities and duties that Scripture communicates as the occupation of New Testament saints. So the, the point I want to make to you is, you know, we need to, obviously, the obvious command here is we need to be part in the church, we need to assemble together, but also, I want to bring to you, uh, you know, how, what's our home life like? You know, do we do we pray with our children? Do we do we um, do we do we tell God when we, you know? Do we tell our children when God answers our prayers? And not just our children, but perhaps we have loved ones. We have uh, some of us have parents who are not saved, or brothers and sisters, and and we want to live our lives so that they see that that the, our religion or our our Christianity is not reserved for for a Sunday meeting, but it, it is something that we live that that we breathe and. Um, so again, you know, so this is the lesson that I get from this man Elkanah, that that he um, that that he you know he sought to, to do more than just go through the motions. He sought to, to keep this life before them. Jesus said, "Wherever two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of them." And and we want the presence of God. We want the presence of God in our in our hearts. We want the presence of God in our homes, and we certainly want the presence of God here in our churches as we assemble. Um, so, uh, and, and also, in, in, I thought, I looked at Acts chapter 2, it says, uh, a simple sentence, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were there, they were all in one accord with one place. So, anybody who didn't gather that day would have missed out on the baptism of the Holy Spirit at that time and the testimony that that had. So, um, 
we have to, uh, you know, keep in mind: do we do we have devotions in our home? Do we do we do we have our personal studies? Do we have something we can share with those that that are important to us? And, and the reason this is, again, looking forward to Han is. You know, when our children, when our loved one come to a point of, as Dr. Coomer called it, a point of impact, are they going to know where to go? Are they going to know to whom they can go with, with their needs, all right? And, and I'm anticipating a message a little bit here, but, but the idea is this man, Elkanah, positioned his wife in a place that when, when the crisis came, she was in a place where she could pray, and she was, she was at the right place at the right time, and that was her husband's doing substantially, all right? So... Um, the next point is the motivation, and obviously the, the, the point I'm building up to is the prayer that Hannah is going to offer. But um, uh, so, so Hannah, was, as we know, the Lord had shut up her womb, and, and it says her adversary also provoked her sore to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband unto her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So the, the point here is there, there's a need and there's a, and there's a provocation. So um, Hannah was childless, and it was, it was, of course, not her choice to be childless. And as we know, she shared this condition with some other women in the Bible. There was Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Elizabeth, and possibly there's some others that I'm not thinking of. So, but, but each of these, uh, with more or less grace, endured this childish condition until the time the Lord uh, uh, determined to, cha to change that. Um, and, and so the question I would put to you is, what urgent needs or what profound needs do you have that you have not brought before the Lord? And why I ask that is because we do forget to pray. You know, sometimes when a need is particularly strong, sometimes prayer is not the thing that occurs to us. Excuse me. Uh, so, so they, um, so, so, um, excuse me, I have a verse here I want to read, Hebrews uh, 4.16. <clears throat> Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find, obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time, excuse me, to find grace to help in the time of need. So we have this command of the Lord. We have an opportunity always to come before the Lord. And again, you know, Hannah had to, was constrained to the temple, but we don't have no such constraint upon us. But yet, do we do we take, avail ourselves of the opportunity to come before God with our needs? And you would think as Christians, you wouldn't have to say that. But the fact is, we do have to say that because because we are conditioned again, I think, by the world to take things in our own hands and to not allow the Lord God to to, to accomplish His purposes and our needs. So. Um, so another point here, I, I also I wanted to point out to you, um, I like the guy statement that, that, Hannah, uh, that Elkanah makes in verse 8. He says, am I not better than these ten sons? Uh, so he doesn't get a response to that, and uh, probably for good reason. He, you know, he, he, uh, that was not, the answer would have been no, correct? He, he, uh, he, he was overstating his, uh, uh, you know, he, was, he was trying to substitute himself in, in place of the child that, that Hannah very much desired. The next thing is the provocation. So there was another house, another woman in the house, right? And she did bear children. Her name was Peninnah. And it, um, it point out is it's a, it's a sorry characteristic of human nature um, to belittle those who, who don't have what we have, right? So, so she had children, so she, she, she felt entitled to, to, to persecute Hannah, who did not have. Uh, but, and we have this tendency, too. We have to be careful because we all have our strong points. We, we don't always acknowledge our weak points, but some of, you know, whether we have intelligence or a, or a skill or wealth or we're blessed with good health, um, it's easy for us to look down on those who don't have those things. And of course, that is, that is pride, you know, and, and uh, you know, suffice to say, I'm just going to give a little moral lesson here and, and hope, hope you'll tolerate it, but, you know, there's no place for such pride in our, in our Christian conduct. Uh, Roman, uh, Romans 12.3 says, for I say, through the grace given unto me, that every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So, so what is our criteria? If we're going to evaluate anybody, it should be ourselves. And if we're going to evaluate anything about ourselves, it should be faith. You know, what is, what is our faith? You know, how is our faith? And I think Bruce, you know, let's go back to his lesson. How do we relate to the God who controls everything, who judges everything, 
who, who, you know, his, who's the, the beginning and end of everything. We relate to him by faith. So what else really matters, okay? The gifts we have of God are, are just gifts. They're, at their best, they are to be used, you know, by God through us to accomplish his purposes. So, you know, the fact that, you know, so none of us are on a, are on a boasting basis, and Scripture deals with that a couple times in Romans. You know, even, uh, even, you know, even obedience to law was not, not a manner of boasting in the book of Romans. So um, also we know that in, in Proverbs, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a, before a fall. Better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So that's my moralization for you today. I hope, I hope you appreciate that. All right. So, so anyway, this, but for the purpose of our lesson here, um, this woman was in, in the picture to drive Hannah to prayer. And to pray in a way that God could use her for His purpose. Okay, and this is you know again back to Bruce's message. You know we have the privilege as believers to pray for God's will. Okay, so God knew what He was going to accomplish here. I'm I'm getting ahead again, but but He um, but He wanted this woman to pray about what He wanted to accomplish in her life. Uh, so so the point is, that if you have somebody in your life that provokes you then count yourself as blessed, right? Because you have, you know, God is trying to, to position you as a, as a praying person. The response to provocation ought to be prayer. Um, the Bible term for this provocation is the word reproach. Um, so we have a couple of texts that, you know, talk about the idea of reproach. My enemies, these are, these are from the book of Proverbs, uh, Psalms. My enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. Psalm 109.25, I became also a reproach unto them, and they looked at me, they shake their heads. Psalm 119.22, remove from me the reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Psalm 119.39, turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. So reproach is not an, a, a, an alien condition to those in the scriptures, right? Reproach is something that, that God's people have to deal with in this world. And, and the question is, what are we going to do with the reproach that comes our way? Uh, if, you, if you go out door knocking on occasion, you, you'll get a reproach. You'll get rebuffed, you know, and, and how, do you, how do you gracefully handle that? Uh, so so uh, the, the, more you're, the more we separate ourselves unto obedience to God, the more difference we put be between ourselves and the world, and the more likely we are to encounter reproach from somebody who will, not, who will refuse to understand these things. All right. So, uh, so the idea here is that um, uh, we are called to bear up under reproach, okay? Um, the Lord Jesus bore up under reproach. That's his testimony in Hebrews. Um, and again, and as, as those that identify with him, we, will, we, have, we have our lot of approach too. And, we, and how do we deal with this? Again, we go back to Bruce's message. God is in control, okay? Um, he, he, will, he will justify. He will administer justice in his time, all right? So, so reproach is born because we know there's a higher authority than human beings. If, if um, the problem with the world, the world does not tolerate reproach, right? Because they only recognize human authority, so humans are are very eager to, to put themselves in a position of what we would call in our day political correctness, right? So we don't have that liberty as believers in Jesus Christ if we really want to walk with God. And we don't have that obligation either, in a better, better way to say it. You know, the, we, 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 can, we can endure reproach because we relate to a God who is sovereign and controls all these things. All right. So, um, so now getting to the point of, of Hannah's prayer in, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, 9 through 11. <clears throat> Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and when they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat on a seat by the post of the temple of the door, and she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou indeed look upon the infliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and forget not thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall come no razor upon his head. All right. So this passage recognizes prayer in particular ways. All right, first of all, I will go back to my other point. Um, it was unto the Lord, because prayer unto the Lord in the place that he chose and in the timing that, that, that he chose. Okay, so she, pray, you know, she, she, was, she was in conformance with the requirements of the, of the Old Testament law at that point. It also says she prayed in bitterness of soul. She prayed in weeping, okay? And she also prayed with commitment to return to the Lord what he gave unto her. All right, so Hannah's prayer is, is not the only one that gets, is prayed this way in, in the scriptures. 
So you know, we, we, you know, if you go through the book of Psalms, you can see these, the, the, the nature of this prayer. Uh, Psalm 44 says, Thou makest a reproach unto our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, excuse me, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame in my face has covered me. So here's the idea of the bitterness being the confusion and shame of face. You know, this was Israel, Israel's uh, experience of being distraught, or, or David's, as a result of, of circumstances. Psalm 69 says, I am weary of my crying, my throat is dried, and my eyes fail while I wait for God. And Psalm 76 says, Vow and pay unto the Lord your God, let all around him bring presents to him that ought to be feared. So again, you know, she, she, she was praying in a way, we often, when we pray, we pray occasionally, in a, we pray in our heads, occasionally we, we put out words, but we don't often, I say, maybe I'll say I'll just um, confine this to myself, we don't often pray with the heart, okay? There's more to us than, than the mind and, and, and our, our lips, you know? And so what the prayer that Scripture recognizes comes from the heart. It's not just... It's not just a mental, mental assent to what is true. It's a, it's a desire to have God's truth realized in the, in the core of our beings, all right? So, um, so, so the question for us to check ourselves is, um, to whom are we praying? Uh, do, do our prayers go to God? Okay, is, and I realize it's a, a simplistic question, but, but um, you know, our, our prayers have to be directed unto God. And... That may be uh, something that you understand for yourself, but again, you, know, you think about uh, if you have children in your home, if you have unbelieving relatives that, that you care about, do they know who they can pray to? You know, is there something, is there something that, that, you know, that, you, that they see in your life that says, yeah, there's God, God is there, and God will respond to, my, to the prayers of those who come to him uh, in, in, in faith and, and, and with, this, with a strong desire to have God's impact in their lives. All right. So um, you know, the idea is that uh, that you know we can we can uh, we can bring our persecutions, we can bring our needs before God, and He will answer them. Um, you know, I keep a couple of verses. You know, there's when in Acts chapter 12, when Peter was imprisoned, the church prayed without ceasing for Peter, and 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 God by those prayers secured Peter's release from prison. We are told. Uh, to confess our faults unto one another and pray to one another that you may be healed. The, the fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. And that fervent prayer is the New Testament word, I think, for what Hannah uh, was, was engaged in, you know, in her, her time of prayer. Uh, fervency is a, is a spiritual characteristic. It, it, uh, we are told in Romans 12, 11, to not be slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And fervency is also, so, 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 excuse me, to describe our love for one another. Okay, so fervency is, is something that comes out of our spirit, and it is something we exercise. It's, it's, it's an earnestness. It's, a, it's an intentional engagement, um, and, and you know, I'm convicted by things like that because I often don't engage um, as I ought with other human beings or with, with circumstances, and so, so, so sometimes you want to maintain this uh, air of detachment, and, and that's not the way that, that we are, what we're being taught here. We are to engage, and we're to, and to, we're to be passionate about our relationship to God and, and about our concerns for the things going on around us, okay? Uh, I also want to point out to you in Nehemiah chapter eight, um, when when they when the people came back in the land and they had built this wall, then they, they pulled out the scriptures and the the Ezra and the priests began to read to the people. The people assembled to, to be read to, and their response to that was they cried, okay, because they realized they had gone generations without obedience to this word, okay. They had you know, when they were in Babylon, they didn't have access to the word of God to the best of our knowledge. They had they had Ezekiel perhaps. But certainly, they didn't have their synagogues. They didn't have their meetings. They didn't have the tabernacle or the temple. So they they were absent from the word of God, and they recognized that as a judgment that was upon them as a people because because they had not valued the word of God when they had it. So um, we have a responsibility to seek to God to pray in this way. We don't manufacture those emotions, but we have a responsibility, I think, to engage with with the, our life with those around us in a way that promotes that kind of prayer within ourselves. All right, and and of course the the principal point in this is that uh, this came with an uh, you know she she offered the son that God would give her uh, to 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 you know back to God. She said, if you give me this son, I will return him. I will I will return him unto you. Uh, she said uh, actually the term she says um, 
I will give him unto the Lord all the days of my life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. So, so this is kind of the acid test for the motivation for our prayer, is what we're praying for is something we're willing to give back to God. Okay, so um, and James chapter 4, uh, of course, tells us um, that, you know, we, you ask and you receive not because, that you, because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So I think that verse, we can take that verse as saying that there are two choices we have when we pray, right? We can, we can pray to the glory of God or we can pray for something that we're craving that we want to ex ex expend upon ourselves for our selfish motives. All right, so Hannah's prayer shows where she's at, right? She wants a child that she can glorify God with. And, and you, know, you know, so I, this, this encouraged me. This is, this is a test for anything I'm praying for. And, and, and I, I know I pray for things that I wanted for me, okay? And I, I have had people ask me to pray for things I know that rose no, no higher than their personal desires or, or cravings. So those are not prayers that God is going to answer, right? Because, because they don't conform to his will. As Bruce said, God has a will, okay? He answers prayers that are according to his will, according to his predetermined purpose. So, so anything that we ask, that, that, and we do ask for things that are contrary to his purpose, and we cannot, scripturally say, speaking, uh, give, you know, expect those to be answered. And this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. All right. So, so this, and this, of course, is the, the profound thing that we take from this passage, is that, is that Hannah's willingness to give back to God that which she so dearly, dearly resired. All right, so... Um, and we see this principle throughout Scripture. Uh, we can start with Abraham's willingness to offer his son Isaac, to sacrifice Isaac, who he dearly desired and wanted. Okay, the Old Testament is full of this. The the first fruit offerings were, were of this nature. Before, you know, they had they were counting on that prosperity. And the first thing they did when they had their first fruits of every year was they brought that that as an offering unto God. All right, and David illustrated it's an interesting passage in um, in in the um, Second Samuel, uh, it says, David was in a hold, okay, a stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was in Bethlehem. So the Philist Philistines at times, you know, they, they were on the coast, and they, they, depending on their relative power, they would encroach into Israel. So they got to as far as Bethlehem, which is, which is pretty far, okay? So uh, David was king at this point, and David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well in Bethlehem that is by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. So this, is, you know, this shows that David's of that same heart. He recognized that, that, you know, that God's grace in this and the sacrifice these men offered, and he would not just spend it upon himself to satisfy his own thirst. He poured it out as a sacrificial offering unto the Lord. So, so this is a principle that Hannah's bringing forward through scriptures, you know, that, that what is worthy about, of us praying for is something that ought to be worth us giving back to God. All right. So, um, so, you know, we have to suggest that, you know, that be a, something that we, and sometimes I think it, the reality is God will change our prayers as, and he lets us pray about a circumstance for a while because he wants to change our prayer to be, to be in line with his will. It may not start out, our prayer may not start out as particular, you know, in line with his will, but he will, he will change it over time. All right. Then we'll look briefly at, at an impediment to prayer. And that impediment to prayer is in the person of this man, Eli, um, in verse, starting in verse 12. And it came to pass, <coughs> as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. And now Hannah spake <coughs> in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she'd been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. I am a spirit, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. And the woman went away and did eat, and her countenance was sad. So I, I titled this, Religious pragmatism. So you have this picture, of Eli. It says he he uh, he took a seat by the by the post of the temple. All right. So so Eli is a high priest, but he seems to have kind of positioned himself as a, a security guard at the temple. All right. Uh, he uh, 
you know, okay, and, and I would say some of the, Eli's history. However, he started his, you know, this is the first time we meet Eli, um, but how, it doesn't tell you how he got to start as a high priest, but it ended badly, okay, his, his high priest. Uh, his sons occupied positions uh, of priesthood under him, and they abused that authority. They, would, they, they, were, um, they misused the sacrifice. They took of the people's sacrifice what they wanted. They took it with the fat on it. They were not supposed to do that. And they also exploited the women that came to offer. Eli knew this, and he did nothing to restrain this. And, and by the end of act, act, uh, chapter 2, Eli is judged, and then, and then later on, he, he and his sons meet death, okay? Um, and they, so they paid for their abuse of the temple uh, you know, with their lives. And I think you, know, you could say, looking at the way the sons operated, that the temple, the tabernacle of God at this time was probably not operating much differently than, than the, the tabernacle or the temples of the idols of the people in the land. Because okay? these are the things we know that went on in idolatrous cultures. There was, there was fornication, there was, there was, there was, there was gluttony and, and, and these feasts. And, and so, so the, the, the high priest's sons were helping themselves. They were conducting themselves like the heathen, the pagans, and, 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 and Eli, who knew better, did not restrain his sons. And, 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 and you know, so this is, this is the culture, this is the situation in which we find this woman Hannah praying. All right, so um, I want to read uh, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 5, because this is, this is how a high priest ought to function. It says, every priest taken from among, among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may be offered both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason thereof, he ought, as for the people also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man takes his honor unto himself, uh, but, but he that is called of God. So, you know, we can say from this that, Eli did not recognize prayer, okay? Um, and remember the, Lord, the Lord's uh, words in, in Matthew 21, uh, 13, later in the temple, he said, uh, you know, uh, you, the house, this is, you know, God says my house shall be called a house of prayer, okay? And when he, when he took up the whip and, and, and chased the merchants out, you know, so it's a similar situation, you know? The, the function of the temple or the ta and the tabernacle had been devalued into a business, a con an exercise, and a commerce. It was not a place of prayer. Um, you know, Eli w you know, was got to be Israel's intercessor before God for the nation, and he, and, and he was responsible to keep that ha the tabernacle as a house of prayer. Um, but, but again, it became for him a place where business was conducted and not, and not a place where, where prayer occurred. Uh, but thankful for us, our, our, our high priest is not so. So finishing the verses in chapter 5, he says, um, So also Christ glorified himself to be, not to be made a high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey, obey him, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So we have this confidence. We have, and, and this, is, of course, is the, uh, is, is, the, is the message of the book of Hebrews. We have a high priest. Yeah, we don't have... Hannah's situation. She encountered a high priest who was nominally hostile to her prayer, but we do not. Our prize, our high priest, is not hostile to our prayer. He's not. He's not indifferent to our needs, and he knows the persecution that we are under, if if that be our circumstances. And he is well able to answer our prayers. Okay, and and he is faithful. He's always on duty. Okay, and and he does not. He does not get tired. His his priesthood does not cease. And uh, you know, there's many things that that characterize his priesthood that was. Uh, did not characterize the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament. All right. So, moving on with this passage, First um, Samuel one nineteen through twenty two, um, and they arose up in the morning, <coughs> and and early and worshipped um, before the Lord and returned and came to their house in, in Ramah. And Elkanah knew his Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come after, her, after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer the Lord to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah would not go up. 
She said unto her husband, I will not go up till the child be, bring, be weaned. Then will I bring him that he may appear before the Lord and abide there forever. So, um, first of all, God heard Hannah's prayer and answered according to her desire. And at this point, her desire, uh, getting back to Bruce's message, what God's will. Okay, they were one and the same. So God, of course, heard and answered her prayer. Um, and, and so, so the question for ourselves, does God answer our prayers? You know, I've asked you if you pray, and I ask myself this, but does God answer? Do you get answers to prayer, okay? And, and so, so uh, you, those, and, and, and we have God's promise that those prayers we pray that are according to his will are the ones that he answers. And um, do you bring your needs and desires to God, and do you seek to bring those needs and desires in the context of what we know from the scriptures about his revealed will? All right, so 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 that the you know that you know if we if we do we can have confidence that God will meet our needs. He will answer our needs in His time and according to His purpose. So so that's what faith is built on. Faith is built on prayers prayed and prayers answered, and you know where we learn to have confidence in God and to and to and to move on to to, to you know in His will to His purposes. All right. So I want to you know close and look at at Hannah's response. Um, to, to God's answer to prayer. And the point is, you know, an answer to prayer does not end our responsibility to God. Um, and unfortunately, I know in my experience, a lot of times I've received an answer to prayer, and then I moved on to the next request. All right. So I want, you know, Hannah gets some closure here. Um, in, in verses 23 through 28, she says, Alcana, And Alcana, her husband, said unto her, Doeth what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou hath weaned him. Only the Lord established his word, so the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, and with three bullocks, and one ephah of flour, and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock, and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as my soul liveth my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord gave me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him unto the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent unto the Lord. And she worshiped the Lord there. All right. So she, she, uh, Hannah honored her vow, okay? She, 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 she kept what she promised to God. And we do sometimes make promises to God, and we should not make those promises lightly. All right. So, um, and then in, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, uh, she praises God. And I want to read these passages because I think, I think it's a, a very beautiful prayer. It's a prayer of victory on Hannah's part. So this answer to prayer was a vindication for her, and she prays in that way. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, and my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like unto our God. Talk no more exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that are full were full have hired themselves out for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that had many children waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh the poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raises the poor out of the dust and lifteth the beggar from the dunghill to set them among the princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in the darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn, the horn of his anointed. And so Elkanah went to Ram in his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Levi the priest. And we know uh, somewhat of Samuel's history after that. But the point is, do we, do we praise God for answered prayer? And going to my first point, do we praise God for answered prayer in front of our children, in front of those that we love, that we want to see trust in the Lord? Does he know, did those people know that God answers our prayer, okay, that, that he has heard it and he has responded, all right? So again, to sum up here, um, what, the things we can learn about prayer. First of all, prayer comes out of preparation, uh, godly prayer comes out of preparation. You know uh, it, it, that you know the time spent honoring God and, and in a spiritual way, in a sense, being where God is. Okay, uh, and prayer has a purpose. 
it should it should be an earnest response to deep desire. Now we know we pray, we have our list, and Paul Paul infers that he did a similar thing. We have we have things we pray for, but but some prayer ought to rise above you know our our prayer list in, in terms of urgency and import, and and it should be something a prayer that we can pray with our whole being. So that, again, this is my third point: true prayer comes from deep inside of us, involves our whole person, um, and there are hindrances to prayer. And so we need to be aware, and, it goes, and get back to Bruce's message, what, what devalues our prayer and what resists prayers in our circumstances. It may be another human being, such as it was for Hannah. Uh, it may be some, it's likely to be something inside of us, uh, or, or just, just the, the situation, the, the, the busyness and things that which we have, the responsibilities we have in life or we have assimilated in life. I think as Christians, it's easy, it's always the struggle, prayer is the struggle in my mind. Okay, it's easy to do. Doing is a lot easier than praying. And so, so uh, Gene and I have talked about this. You know, we, when our kids were young, we, we did in church. We did a lot of doing. We did, we did youth ministries, and, and uh, we made sure our kids were in those ministries, and we did our part. Uh, but the, the point we talked about was we never, we never talked at home. We did our home devotions, but we never talked about what the Lord was doing in our lives. We never shared with them our, our struggles uh, when they were young, and we never struggled the victories that, or, or never shared the victories that God gave to prayer. All right, So our children uh, didn't have the benefit of seeing the, you know, that Christian life acted out in us. This, I'm sorry for this autobiography here, but I think it's appropriate. Um, so we, I encourage you with young children to do differently, all right? Um, and, and finally, our responsibility to God regarding prayer does not end with his answer, okay? There is a response that, that's appropriate. There's a response of praise. There's a response of keeping the commitments we have made to God. And as a responsibility of stewardship for that answer, an answer given to us is, you know, it, later on you see that uh, uh, as, as Samuel grew up, every year uh, Hannah showed up and she showed up with clothing for him as he grew up. So she did not forget about her son as an answer to prayer. And she kept, and she, 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 you know, she kept track of her son through those years, even though she couldn't be with him. And she, she maintained her stewardship as a mother uh, and as one who had received prayer. And, and we have a similar responsibility for the answers of prayer that we have. We, uh, again, we can't just say, got an answer there, time, time to move on down, next thing on the checklist.